I welcome all the many participants. I have just two remarks. Um, please, this session is being recorded, so in case you do not wish to be recorded, you are kindly asked to leave the session now. As well, um, it is a good idea to stay tuned after the session because it will be followed uh, by another very interesting uh, webinar about climate. Climate needs women innovating for water sanitation and fecal sludge management. So I ensure you, you should stay tuned definitely for the session afterwards as well. Um, my name is Alice Brandt. I'm one of your two moderators today. I will just very briefly talk you through the agenda and give a brief introduction to our session speakers. Um, here you see a slide with some new publications on menstrual hygiene and health. They're brand new with very uh, interesting insights and you can download them at the website sustainablesanitation.org. Please, can I have the next slide? This is the title of the show. <laughs> next one, please. Yes, so this is the agenda. We will have a brief keynote by famous Dr. Inga Winkler, Inga Winkler uh, from the Columbia University. This will be followed by a very colorful range of insights from the field from many different countries. Um, then there will be a brief panel discussion in which you as audience will have the chance to ask questions directly to the speakers. If you wish to do so, please type your questions into the chat box and we will make sure that we will get back to each one of you. And then finally, we will have some closing words and then look at the way forward. Next slide, please. So this is our team today. Let me start with Mr. Gunnar Raj Shrestha. He has been the national coordinator for the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council for six years. Now he is the national convener for menstrual health in Nepal since 2017. Mr. Shrestha is uh, passionate to establish a dignified menstruation in Nepal and also beyond around the world. Moving on to Ina Jorgam. She's the International Coordinator for Menstrual Hygiene Day since 2014, and she's the Head of Behavior Change Communication at the German NGO WASH United. She joined WASH United in 2012. Also, many toilets and hand washing steps ago, Ina was an intern at the GTZ back then in 2002. Then we have uh, Annika Malkus. She is an expert for stakeholder coordination and focal point for menstrual hygiene management and skills development in Uganda. She's been living in Uganda for nine years, mainly at the country office of the Welthungerhilfe. Annika, as much as she tries, she just cannot remember any proverbs. This is a fun fact about her. Um, we will move on to the left uh, slide, which is uh, Chiki Devera. She um, is an expert at GIZ for the program Fit for School in the Philippines. She first started doing research work on infectious diseases, uh, specifying on neglected tropical diseases in the Philippines. And this is when she first started to get some background knowledge on WASH as well. She is currently involved in the COVID-19 response related work in her country. Chiki drinks four to five liters of water each day. Wow, this is a lot, but she does not like vegetables. And then we have also Thorsten Kiefer. He is the CEO and co-founder of the NGO WASH United. Thorsten is so incredibly dedicated to the topic of sanitation that once he did a tour of New York City dressed as a toilet for an entire day, he even took the tube. I saw the pictures, it really happened. Last but not least, we have Rabia Baloch. She is an advisor for the GIZ Global Program Sanitation for Millions in Pakistan. She has been in the development sector for almost nine years and she joined Sanitation for Millions in February this year. Uh, Rabia also has 
Phasmophobia, which is an irrational fear of listening to horror stories and watching horror movies. I can totally relate to that. So these are the stars of our show today. Maybe on to the next slide in case I forgot someone. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> the moderators today is uh, me, I already introduced myself, and Tabea Zeitz from the GIZ program, support to the health sector uh, in Nepal. And now, if I am not completely mistaken, we will hear an exciting uh, keynote by Dr. Inge Winkler. Uh, just a few words about her. She is a lecturer at the U Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University, and her research focuses on socioeconomic rights, development, gender, social justice, and equality. So without further ado, I suggest we watch the little keynote by Inga Winkler. Enjoy. Thanks, Inga Winkler. I'm on the faculty at Columbia University at the Institute for the Study of Human Rights. Um, my work is at the intersection of human rights, gender, and quite a bit of work on menstruation. And that's the reason I'm here today. I would like to speak about the global menstrual movement and its future directions. So I started working on menstruation over a decade ago. And at the time, I often encountered raised eyebrows and puzzled faces. However, skepticism quickly turned into aha moments as people realized that menstruation does indeed matter. And once they uttered the word menstruation, it became easier to think and talk about its meanings and challenges. We've come a really long way since then. A burgeoning movement of NGOs, civil society, community-based organizations, social entrepreneurs, international organizations, and activists is focused on menstrual hygiene. Menstrual Hygiene Day 2020 set new records in terms of campaign involvement. And the Menstrual Health Hub lists more than 700 organizations working in the field. The media regularly covers menstruation, and many countries have adopted policies on menstruation. Delegates in the halls of the United Nations have repeatedly recognized that the fact that many of us bleed regularly does indeed matter and has implications for human rights. While these developments are really impressive and I find them very encouraging, I also see some risks and limitations. The menstrual movement is full of opportunities so I'd like to share a few points for charting future directions to build on the progress made and to move ahead boldly for lasting change. In the early days of my, well, let's call it menstrual journey, I was working with the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Water and Sanitation. And as such, I was very much embedded in the water, sanitation and hygiene sector, the wash sector. And the wash sector proved to be an excellent entry point for addressing menstruation. Water and sanitation professionals who deal with species and sludge management do not seem to be intimidated by a few ounces of blood, mucus and uterine tissue. And I strongly believe, I really believe that we wouldn't be where we are today in making menstruation matter without the initial push in the wash sector. But we've talked about this entry point for years, and it's time to move into the broader menstrual space by capitalizing on the current menstrual movement. It has the potential to become a transformative movement for gender justice and human rights that addresses the myriad dimensions of menstruation, and we need to work actively towards that. With the wash sector often comes a focus on building facilities and providing menstrual products that are perceived as quick material fixes to address menstrual needs. 
I certainly don't want to dismiss the need for something to catch the flow. But we must acknowledge that the barriers many people face are far more complex and can't be overcome by a piece of cotton or even medical grade silicone. To be sure, we also see many menstrual hygiene initiatives that are focused on education, but all too often these are limited to teaching a girl how to put a pad in her panties. And I'm exaggerating. But what we need is comprehensive menstrual education that takes body literacy seriously and goes far beyond menstrual hygiene education. It's about understanding bodily processes and changes over the life course. It overlaps with comprehensive sexuality education and sexual awareness. It opens up discussions about social norms, gendered expectations and gender identity. And it provides space for dialogues about cultural and religious meanings of menstruation and their varied interpretations. Ultimately, we need to create the conditions in which menstruators can make informed decisions about all aspects of their menstruation, free of judgment and constraint. We see, we currently see a shift in terminology from menstrual hygiene to menstrual health, or at least to include menstrual health. However, in many instances, this seems to be merely word replacement rather than actual conceptual shift. But what we need is broader and more comprehensive awareness raising, prom programming and policy making. Our aim must be to normalize menstruation, to make attention to the menstrual cycle standard practice. And above all that requires that we tackle menstrual stigma, which persists in countries across the world. Current efforts to improve mental hygiene have been criticized for actually reinforcing menstrual stigma. The focus on cleanliness and hygiene sends a message to menstruators to make sure to keep our messy, leaky bodies under control. Menstrual products and wash facilities alone will not normalize menstruation and change sociocultural norms. It is certainly true that many organizations make commitments to address stigma, to break the silence, to raise awareness, but there's a risk that these commitments remain lip service and fail to create the structural conditions to tackle stigma. To get there, we need to understand and address how concerns about menstrual disclosure, self-monitoring and stigma contribute to psychosocial stress, anxiety, and how in turn this affects healthcare, education, experiences in the workplace, and other aspects of public and private life. Consider that many menstruators hesitate to seek medical advice, and healthcare providers are not necessarily trained on menstrual cycle related conditions. For instance, it takes up to a decade to be diagnosed with endometriosis. In the context of work, barriers are perpetuated through sociocultural norms embedded in a society that is characterized by gender inequalities, where women earn less and are perceived as less capable. And in particular, when menstruating, we are often seen as hysterical, not trustworthy, and unfit for decision making. We also know that menstruating individuals are often unfamiliar with bodily processes, especially before reaching menarche. This includes misconceptions and negative or ambivalent feelings about menstruation. And again, that may cause anxiety and impact individuals' ability to concentrate and study, thus having huge implications for the human right to education. So unless there's a concerted effort aimed at undoing deeply entrenched menstrual stigma, it will persist. So the final point I want to make is about who we are talking about when we talk about people who menstruate. 
Because when surveying the field, one could almost get the impression that only schoolgirls menstruate, failing to acknowledge the diversity of menstrual experiences and needs. The sustainable development agenda calls on us to leave no one behind, and we need to take this commitment seriously. We need to ask ourselves, by focusing data collection and programming on girls in schools, do we further entrench the marginalization of girls who are out of school? By framing menstrual health as an adolescent girl's issue, do we ignore other issues across the life course, in particular health issues related to perimenopause and menopause? Do we acknowledge women who do not menstruate? And conversely, do we address the needs and experiences of menstruators who identify as trans or non-binary or gender non-conforming? Do we address the unique needs of menstruators with disabilities who are sometimes forcibly sterilized as a means to so-called manage menstruation? And do we understand how menstrual stigma intersects with race, ethnicity, caste, class, culture, religion, and other factors? Do we understand the lived experiences of menstruators living in poverty, in detention, on the move, in camps, in shelters, or on the streets? At present, we too often shrug our shoulders instead of addressing these questions. In the menstrual movement, we need to reconsider whose voices we consider leading, authoritative, and worthy of amplification. We need a much more concerted effort in policy, practice, and research to decenter our menstrual health efforts, to include all people who menstruate, and address the double stigma that many menstruators face. So finally, a little plug, and you've seen some of the slides about the handbook, with some little nitbits. So the Palgrave Handbook of Critical Menstruation Studies is a new resource that provides timely, comprehensive, and thought-provoking research and reflections from policy and practice. I co-edited it with five colleagues, and it's available online free of charge thanks to the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council, who provided the funding to make it open access. And I would say it covers menstruation in almost all its facets and dimensions. And I hope that it can inform next steps for a transformative menstrual movement. I should add that we're organizing a virtual launch of the handbook on September 24th. So I hope to see you again in a few weeks to discuss more menstrual matters. Many thanks. Thank you, Inga Winkler, even though she is not present in person at the moment, we are very happy for her um, input on this very important topic. Um, and we will also share the link in this chat for those of you who would like to download um, the compilation. Um, as she has said, um, MHM is embedded and has started from the wash sector to, to become a topic globally discussed. However, um, as we have seen also, and as many of you know, working in this, um, in this field, it, it can just be an entry point for MHM, since this is a topic far wider than just going in the um, belonging to the wash sector. It is indeed a quite fundamental topic and covering human rights, education, um, also environmental topics um, and many more. So also for today's discussion and the panelists we have invited, um, the main question behind that we were asking them is um, to get to know how do they and how do you um, position MHM beyond the wash sector as a priority. And um, as the first speaker, I would like to invite Thorsten Kiefer now to continue with his input. Hello, Tabea. Do you hear me? Yes, thanks. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me on the session um, to talk about um, MH Day um, 2020. Um, Menstrual Hygiene Day 2020 um, was quite a roller coaster. Um, the scale and impact of MH Day has grown immensely since we started in 2014, especially in the last two years. 
Um, and at the start of this year, um, we at the MHA Secretariat were, were really hopeful that in 2020 we would be able to make the next step in, in the fight to end period stigma and, and period poverty. But then came COVID-19 and many MHA partners were hit hard by the crisis, both in terms of programming um, and also financially. Um, and besides, the social distancing rules meant that there would not be on the ground events um, MHA 2020 would need to be digital only. Um, frankly, we had no idea whether MHA partners, the media, decision makers would add their voices as strongly as they did in previous years or whether actually COVID-19 would push MHH off the table this year. Um, despite the pandemic, MHA this year was, please next slide, um, despite the pandemic, um, MHA was bigger and more impactful than ever this year. Um, we're now a movement of more than 630 partner organizations from all around the world, ranging from grassroots organizations to government agencies and the world's leading corporate actors. Um, this year, um, 4,141 articles um, appeared in online media um, addressing the issue, ranging from Al Jazeera to the independent to local media. Um, around the world, and um, that's almost double the number of media coverage um, we had in 2019, despite the pandemic. And, and that number doesn't even include TV, radio, and print, um, which we, we cannot have. Um, this year, we had 151,000 contributions on social media, including tweets from Bollywood superstar Akshay Kumar, and also a really, really powerful video from Parliamentary Secretary um, State Secretary Dr. Maria Flaxbart, um, and we're excited that since this year, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development also is an, is an official partner and supporter of Menstrual Hygiene Day. In total, all of this together, collectively, all our partners, we reached 411 million people um, with positive messaging around menstruation through digital channels alone. Um, please, the next slide. Um, there's a red ribbon for HIV AIDS, there's a rainbow flag for LGBTQ rights. We know that visual symbols really have uh, the power to activate people and catalyze social change. This year we introduced a global symbol for menstruation and we are thrilled to see how people around the world have used the bracelet to help end period stigma. This included um, staff from Pinchy in the United States, um, top left picture, then in the middle right, a hundred, more than a hundred GIZ staff who put on the bracelet to raise their voice against period stigma. Young girls from Bhutan to Russia to Kenya, um, more than 30 members of German, German parliament um, and Canadian uh, Minister of International Development, Karina Gold, um, who added their voice to the campaign using the menstrual bracelet as, as a symbol. Um, people were super creative. Um, we received pictures from activists in Nepal that made menstrual bracelets out of chilies. We received pictures of menstruation bracelets from feathers, from stones, from flowers. Um, one of my favorite pictures is in the top right corner. Um, we, we received it from a doctor in India. Um, who during lockdown couldn't go to the shop to get beads. So basically she looked what she had in the apartment, found double-sided uh, tape, chickpeas, colored them in different colors and made herself a bracelet and sent that to us. So um, yeah, really, really powerful how, how people used it. And we're excited that we now have a, a key visual symbol for our work moving forward. Please, the next slide. So what's coming up? Um, on 23 September, we're organizing Studio MHJ Impact, a live online event everyone can join. In that event, we'll have a detailed look at the results of MHJ 2020 and share interesting learnings. Um, we'll have a range of really exciting partners joining us on the show, so please mark it down in your calendars. Um, around 11 October, International Day of the World Child, we are planning a micro campaign focusing on menstrual hygiene education, which again, everyone can join. 
Um, in October, we will also be launching a new website um, that focuses on the issue of period taxes around the world, including an advocacy guide that supports organizations and activists to, to campaign on the issue. Um, in November, we are planning a funders roundtable. Um, while MHJ and the amount of work it creates for us as a secretariat has grown significantly over the past few years, funding has been flat. So that's something we really need to address to sustain and further scale the impact of MH Day over the next few years. Then, of course, like next year, um, MH Day um, 2021, um, 2020 was supposed to be like the super year uh, for gender equality at the UN. Now everybody is looking at 2021 um, to be that year, including the Generation Equality Forum, um, probably around July, create opportunities to really further um, the menstrual health and hygiene um, agenda. Um, we believe that it's possible to end period stigma and period poverty by 2030. Um, but to, to really get there, um, yeah, we, we now have to translate talk um, into action. So it, it really is time for action um, on, on menstrual health and hygiene. Thank you, Thorsten. I agree, it is time for action and it is really impressive what you from uh, Wash United have initiated and how this movement is growing. I'm, I'm quite impressed and um, all of us, I guess, um, support this and have also been supporting Wash United in the global campaign in the past months. Um, and what I also found quite, yeah, most impressive is to see the rise in numbers of um, activities and also of organizations and people that really address the topic also on a political agenda. And uh, one of these is also um, our next speaker going to talk about. It is the MHMPA in Nepal, um, Partners Alliance on Menstrual Health and Hygiene Management, uh, with more than 70 organizations who are um, actively addressing menstruation and dignified menstruation also on the political agenda in Nepal. And I would like to invite Gunaraj Shrestha now to um, introduce MHMPA. Hello, hi everyone. Good, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, time, time is different uh, in the globe. Um, so, uh, Tavi was highlighting now in my presentation, I will try to give some brief introduction of uh, this uh, MHM uh, Partners Alliance in Nepal. And then I will briefly talk about the uh, policy environment, MHM policy environment in Nepal. So, just to begin with, um, so this uh, we initiated uh, partners alliance uh, in 2017, right? So Tabi was mentioning uh, 70, uh, but in our records shows that 80 around 80 organizations. Normally this is being informal. The numbers are quite fluctuating, but at the moment uh, we have a record of 80 organizations, including um, UN organizations. Uh, in the UN, we have UNICEF, uh, UN Habitat, UN WFPA, WFPA uh, these all UN agencies in Nepal, and some bilateral organizations also, like Finnish Embassy, uh, US Embassy, uh, also members. And there are a lot of uh, INGOs and NGOs, normally they work uh, in WASP sector. And the media also, quite interesting. we have the media also as members, and there are uh, academicians, uh, professors, researchers, and uh, we have also national celebrities, uh, cine stars, and some other uh, Miss Nepal's, Miss World Nepal's also are the members. So it's quite a different type of uh, members are there in the alliance established in 2017. Normally we work for, I, I'm giving this bullet, uh, whatever work we are doing uh, in Nepal uh, with this alliance. Normally we work for the policy advocacy across various sectors because uh, menstruation is uh, related with different sectors, education, health, was uh, women and children. So we are working with the different ministries, the four ministries for the policy advocacy. And most importantly, we are providing the advisory support to the government, um, different ministries to formulate their plan and programs also. <coughs> Sorry. 
So in the meantime, we are also uh, it's a, a knowledge uh, sharing platform also. So every month, every by month, we meet all uh, members. We meet and share the knowledge, what is happening and where happening, what are the lessons, what are the challenges we are facing. We share the knowledge, uh, the original knowledge, I would say, across all members. Uh, then for to create uh, the evidences for MHM, we do have this innovation and research work also to our members. <coughs> and mostly we are also working, most importantly, we are uh, uh, just to align that there are many organizations, including government and non-governmental, they, they are having their own program and plans. So with this alliance, we are trying to integrate our, I would say, aligning actions of different government and non-governmental organizations to bring the synergy across the country. And for this, the COVID also, um, we are doing a little bit to response MHM related issues and problems to address the, especially for disabled uh, female and women, uh, the people, uh, the poor women, we are helping with some uh, the parents and you know uh, in the COVID situation in Nepal also not quite suffering from the COVID. So this is all about uh, our alliance. Now next uh, slide, please. <coughs> so I will talk about the the whole um, history, the how is uh, the policy and the act in Nepal, uh, what is rolling out in terms of in terms of this policy and plans. So if you see, um, uh, really something started to, in 2005, the Supreme Court um, ordered to, the, uh, order to the, uh, the government to develop an act to eliminate Chaupadi. Chaupadi in Nepal, um, somebody knowing, but many of you may not be knowing the Chaupadi is a Nepali word, but the, the women during menstruation are forced to live in cow seeds. It's quite insecure cow um, uh, They are taken out from the home and forced to live in cow seat. We call it chaupadi. So this is quite inhuman, inhuman activity. So the Supreme Court ordered uh, the government to, uh, to 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 develop an act uh, to ban this chaupadi system in 2005. But it seems the government, after three years only, the government uh, uh, formulated one guideline. They call it uh, chaupadi elimination guideline endorsed by the government only after three years, um, that, that means uh, 2008. <coughs> and now you see, uh, so that guidelines really didn't help actually. Uh, it was for the sake of guidance, but it really didn't help to control, to eliminate a child police system. But if you see, I just jump in here, jump here. Only in 2000, 2017, the government, the parliament again enforced one criminal code of conduct, right? So if someone found um, forcing the women and girls to chaupadi, they are imprisoned uh, for three months jail and US dollar around 30 uh, as a fine for the chaupadi. So only in 2017, it seems a bit uh, um, very uh, strong, uh, the criminal court uh, in, for, um, in force um, in Nepal. So if you see this, uh, uh, the history uh, in, in terms of policy, emergency policy in Nepal, uh, really it looks into, so really gear, gear up from 2017. So 2017, 18, and 19, and 20, there has been a lot of policy related uh, um, initiatives in Nepal. So at the beginning of 2017, we had a national policy consultation workshop on MHM for the first time in Nepal. There was a large stakeholders policy consultation uh, uh, initiated by the Water Supply Ministry and was technical assistant by WSSCC. So that time I was the national coordinator for WSSCC. So since last uh, last six uh, years, I was with WSCC as a national coordinator. So I was just working with the ministry for this policy dialogue. So again, in 2017, we had a national. Uh, so we had a, a national level human resource development program, international training in 2017. So we had a very uh, international level training, so develop uh, human resource Nepal. Then 2018, uh, the, the first draft national policy and thinking about menstruation, it was drafted by four ministries. So fortunately, I was the co-lead uh, to formulate and to lead that uh, drafting, the drafting committee. 
in 2018, um, the four ministries uh, made a joint declaration. They call it seven point declaration. Mostly there is a policy level commitment by four ministries, especially to eliminate the poverty system and the policy enforcement and the education. Different sector wide ministries made commitment uh, to do something on MHM. And 2019, again, quite interesting in 2009, in the president of Nepal, being a female in Nepal, she uh, announced in all Nepal there will be free pad distribution to all the public schools. So in Nepal, there are around 30,000 public schools, 1.4 million girls. Uh, so the government decided, the president decided, announced free pad distribution to these uh, across uh, Nepal. So initial budget, some $10 million in 2000, so in terms of budget, $10 million. And again, in 2020, the government has continued this program in 2020. Now we have a 16 million, one six, 16 million dollar government has allocated for prepaid distribution. Thank um, you so much. government has, yeah, okay. I think mm -hmm. now this, I have completed. Yeah, now just one second, okay. yeah. You can see this. So there is a school. So school curriculum also quite revised from grade four to twelve to include MHM adequately in the school curriculum. So these are all policy level things happening in Nepal. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Tavia. Thank you very much uh, for sharing. It is quite impressive what has been going on in the past years in Nepal and how this movement really has gained momentum and has gained members and is is growing stronger every year actually. Um, so I will make it short because uh, as I said we are running a little bit out of time and just hand over to Rabia Baloch to tell us about infrastructure um, in Pakistan. Chikidi. Oh sorry, <laughs> sorry for my mistake. Um, I'm handing over to Chiki Vera from GIZ Philippines. Hi, um, good afternoon everyone from Manila. Um, I hope you can hear me. Hello. Yes. yes, we can hear you. Yes. Hi. OK, and good morning, of course, to those who are currently in Europe or other parts of the world. So again, my name is Chiki from the GIZ Pit for School program in the Philippines, and I will be talking about scaling integrated programming and presenting the MHM data in the Philippines. So next slide, please. Yeah, so. The fit for school concept on MHM includes primary and secondary interventions. So those in orange that you see are the primary interventions and those in green are the secondary interventions. But for this presentation, let's just focus on the primary interventions. So the primary interventions included in the fit concept are first access to information, female friendly sanitation facilities and access to MHM supplies. And lastly, integration with existing monitoring system of the education sector. So in the Philippines, the Washington Schools program is anchored through a Department of Education order called the Comprehensive Policy and Guidelines on Water Sanitation and Hygiene in Schools. And the primary interventions of MHM are part of the crucial wins indicators in the monitoring system of the Department of Education. And these are monitored through the three-star approach along with other indicators on WASH. So next slide, please. So um, the baseline monitoring was conducted in school year 2017 to 2018 with 30,586 schools, both primary and secondary. And uh, the follow-up monitoring was conducted in school year 2018, 2019 with 35,005 schools. So uh, we actually measure a lot more indicators on MHM than those listed here, but in the interest of time, I will only be presenting those that I think are the most important ones for MHM. So first for water availability in schools, we can see here an improvement from baseline to follow up an increase from 63% to 72.2%. Uh, and that's also the same for functional toilets that are private, secure and have door locks there's an increase from 80.5% to 85.6%. So for access to sanitary pads, we can see here in the data a marked increase from 39.1% at the baseline to 74.7% at the follow-up. And 
in terms of access to information, first for the IEC materials for teachers, there's also an increase from 34.3% to 45.9%. And for the students, 36.9% uh, at the baseline and 48.7% at the follow-up. And for the information and proper disposal of sanitary pads, it's also an increase from 57.5% to 70.8%. So that means that most schools actually have information already on the proper disposal of sanitary napkins. So obviously, there's still a lot of work to be done in MHM in the Philippines, but it's also good to see that we see a lot of improvements in the first two years of implementation with almost all aspects actually related to MHM improving from baseline to follow up. And it also shows that the schools show more improvements in terms of management aspects. And lastly, based on the data here, we, we can see that the monitoring can, can be used as a guide to allow the schools to check which aspects to improve on and which, which areas they should allocate more resources on to improve their MHM status. So next slide, please. So on the question on how do you position MHM as a priority beyond WASH sector, I think what really worked for the FIT program is the integration of MHM with the education sector. And it's very important to align it with the national standards and policies. And by integrating it with the education sector, it allows use of existing resources and it provides a catchment area since schools serve as a good venue to conduct activities given that students and teachers are already there, and actually sometimes even parents too. And another advantage of integrating MHM with the education sector is that it allows you to target the students and talk about MHM with young girls and boys. So it helps with acceptance and removing stigma at an early stage, at the early stage of their lives. And since the activities are conducted through the Philippine Department of Education, we can ensure, or at least it will help ensure, that the activities we've started can be sustained later on. And of course, positioning M MHM as a priority beyond the WASH sector of, will entail being more inclusive, and that's by involving different stakeholders, groups such as uh, the teachers, parents, and the community. And lastly, one of the good practices of the FIT program that contributed to its scale up, especially on MHM, is the use of data as a form of advocacy and to promote action from the different levels of the education sector. And specifically for schools, the monitoring data allowed them to identify which areas are they lagging behind, which will need more focus in order to improve the status of MHM. So this will be my last slide. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Rab. Uh, <laughs> again, I'm confused with the name, sorry. Thank you, Tiki, for sharing um, your experiences um, in the Philippines. And I think education is also uh, one of the main topics that um, Annika Malhus is now. Oh. Again, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Now Rabia Bloch is going to talk um, about their project in Pakistan on infrastructure and also um, um, health in institutions in Balochistan. Please go ahead. Rabia, can you hear us? Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Tabea. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be part of the session today. I am Rabia, working with GIZ Pakistan and Sanitation for Millions program, which is a global program with the aim to provide access to safe sanitation and, and hygiene. Pakistan is one of the partner countries and implementation is focused in Balochistan, which is the largest province in terms of land area with scattered population. Next slide, please. Coming to the topic, menstrual health and hygiene. Approximately 210 million people live in Pakistan. 40% of females of total female population are in menstruating age. 
Balochistan is socially tribal area in Pakistan where menstrual health and hygiene has been largely neglected. Women and girls have no access to knowledge and services. Health is not considered as human right. As a result, millions of women and girls denies their right to health, education and gender equality. The MMR rate is also very high comparatively due to the mismanaged menstruation. In Pakistan, the topic becomes a priority because menstrual health and hygiene and gender sensitive solutions are essential for sustainable development and an effective approach to empower women and girls to overcome uh, cultural taboos related to menstrual health and improve opportunities for girls uh, for a better education. Sanitation for Millions designed and implemented measures on menstrual health and hygiene in public institutions and healthcare facilities. In Balochistan, in the cooperation, uh, in cooperation with the government uh, department of Balochistan, the education department, and with the support of its implementing partner. The measures on menstrual health and hygiene, as you see, is a, a combined package of awareness creation, supplies provision, infrastructure, and of course, we have not uh, no, left behind the menstrual ma uh, uh, waste management. Coming towards the awareness creation under the program, uh, 200 public school teachers and lady health workers from the health department have been trained as trainer on menstrual health and hygiene with the objective that these trainers will further uh, tailor the knowledge in the schools and communities. Because we believe that a teacher is considered as a role model for a student and a student is more comfortable to discuss the issues with the teacher. With the LS, while the LHWs are uh, fully recognized members of the health sector who are supporting the health system at household or community level, we consider to train them because they have the access and the acceptance uh, in the community. Uh, they are already going house to house and raising awareness on menstrual health and hygiene amongst, among parents, particularly with mothers. Similarly, we have provided menstrual health and hygiene kits to the students and the teachers in 13 public schools as well as in 18 healthcare facilities. We uh, approximately we have um, benefited 50,000 uh, girls and women uh, through our MHM measures, uh, both the, the infrastructure and the awareness creation. Initially, the girls were deprived from the image facilities in the beginning of the Sanitation for Millions program. Um, we are sanitation, uh, 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 sanitation for Millions constructed uh, women and girls friendly toilets uh, in 13 uh, public schools uh, so that the girls and students have a sense of security and privacy to manage their needs in menstruation. Sanitation for Million is, uh, has successfully developed, as I earlier uh, mentioned, the menstrual waste management guidelines. Uh, we are very much hopeful to incorporate these guidelines uh, in the policies at provincial level uh, of government education department. So please, next slide. Next slide, please. This is a uh, one step ahead to the next slide. Sorry. Yeah, these are some of the photographs and I would like to give a key uh, takeaway message along with these pictures. Increase access to information and education to help break the silence, stigma and taboos surrounding uh, to the menstruation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabia. Very, very well done, everyone. A big round of virtual applause to all of our speakers. Tabea, correct me if uh, I'm yes. saying the right words right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's actually two speakers missing. And, and now um, we would like to um, offer uh, Anika Markwood to address the audience. Um, also quickly um, talking about her program in Uganda, which addresses uh, in a way also, I guess, teaching. Um, yeah, you're working for Weltunga Hilfe and um, hopefully you can. Exactly. I, I can hear you and uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be invited for this session um, and to um, give you a brief insight into our programming um, on menstrual hygiene and health management here in Uganda for Welthungerhilfe. Um, we have a project on menstrual health and hygiene management in Karamoja, which uh, started being implemented in 2018, in May 2018, to be very precise. Um, in this project called Ecopolo, um, we are targeting altogether 2,000 schoolgirls from altogether three, uh, 13 secondary schools, all over five districts in central and south Karamoja. Uh, Karamoja is a sub-region in eastern Uganda, as many of you might know. And uh, with this project, we basically want to achieve that the access to improved methods of menstrual hygiene is improved for these schoolgirls, but also um, to enhance knowledge on menstruation, on menstrual health, but also on sexual reproductive health uh, for school boys, school girls, but also uh, looking at uh, structures around such as school management, school teachers, and um, on district level to create a supportive environment for these girls. Um, how do we do this? Um, Welthungerhilfe has mainly two areas of intervention in the Ecopolo project, which is um, a very important part of it uh, is menstrual health and sexual reproductive health education at the schools and on district level. Um, where we include both uh, girls and boys. Um, we include teachers, we include parents, we include school management, but we also include um, dist district education officers, district health officers into this education program. Um, and on the other hand, we are distributing menstrual cups to these 2,000 schoolgirls in the targeted school uh, to um, improve their access to uh, an improved menstrual hygiene management product. Um, if you could give me the next slide, that would be wonderful. Yes. Um, our intervention has been accompanied by a CAP survey that um, we have conducted at the very beginning of the project and so far we have had a midterm survey as well uh, because it's of course a very innovative approach. Um, I think hardly anybody has worked with menstrual cups before in um, in this project region. So for us, it was very important to learn and to see what is working well and where do we um, face challenges and where do we have to improve our programming. Um, so what has worked well so far? From our experience, very clearly um, the multi-stakeholder approach. Um, involving not only the girls and boys, but also involving the school management, involving teachers, involving parents, but also involving uh, health personnel from, uh, from the health sector, from uh, nearby health facilities, has shown to be very, very successful. Um, why? Because um, for the girls, it seems to be, or it shows us, it's very important to create a kind of support structure, a supportive environment that encourages the girl, first of all, to use the menstrual cup, to um, answer questions about menstruation, to answer questions about uh, the challenges they are facing on the way. So um, to have multiple stakeholders on board that support the girls has proven to be very successful. Um, the next uh, success factor we have seen is the engagement of boys in the uh, menstrual, menstrual health education and sexual reproductive health education. Um, it's not a topic only for girls, but it's a topic equally for boys. And it's equally important to um, 
to make the topic of menstruation a normal topic, yeah, to show menstruation is normal, it's something natural, um, and to have boys in the boat or on board uh, when we are educating and sensitizing on this topic is, is extremely important uh, to reduce the stigma on menstruation. Um, yeah, the next very important thing um, for us was to have close follow-ups, to have to ensure mentoring and coaching for the girls. Um, that it's not a one-off educational session, but that we are really in a longer-term process to accompany the girls, but also accompany the other stakeholders that are uh, working day to day with the girls. Um, Last but not least to mention uh, on the success uh, factors side are the partnerships we have been working in. Um, I want to mention Ruby Cup here very clearly. Ruby Cup has been very supportive uh, with educational material but also um, uh, with donating menstrual cups to us and make all this possible. Then, of course, we are um, uh, very happy about the private donations that have helped us to actually uh, implement this project and also to make it bigger than we thought in the beginning. And uh, on the capacity development side, we are very thankful. We have worked very successfully together with Womena, who has helped us a lot to actually set up the whole project and to uh, strengthen the capacity capacities of our uh, project team as well. Um, the challenges we have seen um, are of course around myths and uh, misconceptions about me menstruation but also about the menstrual cup. This is a very new product in the area and it, um, it was necessary or it was very important from our side to be in close communication about menstruation, about the menstrual cup, to be able to answer questions and engage in dialogues with all the different stakeholders. Um, the hygienic handling of the menstrual cup has been challenging in the beginning as we are working in boarding school settings. So it turned out that the only opportunity where the girls could actually disinfect or boil the cup was a big school kitchen with huge cooking pots, which was obviously not an option. So we have decided in this project to support the schools and specifically support the girls additionally with uh, solar cookers where they can actually boil their cup at the end of their menstruation to disinfect their cup. Um, mm -hmm. A big challenge, and that's maybe the last one I want to uh, mention, was of course the impact of COVID-19. Um, as in many other countries, Uganda has been in a lockdown for two months. The schools still remain closed. We don't have a date for reopening yet, and it requires um, many changes in our ways of project implementation. So at the moment, uh, our project team, instead of reaching out to schools, is actually reaching out to communities and uh, to the girls in their communities um, to somehow ensure the follow up and somehow ensure that we keep on going with uh, a support structure for the girls. Reaching out to the communities also means that the demand for additional menstrual cup cups is huge. The communities get to know about the menstrual cup uh, through the girls, through the project. And so far, we have not been able to fulfill this demand and to um, to sustain um, sustainable access to menstrual hygiene products um, and to the menstrual Anita? cup specifically. Yes. Can you can you please close uh, your presentation course, so we have course. time that's, for the last? That's, Thank you. That's actually my, my end already. Yeah. So um, yeah, you... this part from my side. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Tabea, is your microphone working? You're shaking your head. No, it's not. OK, so. I mean, now you're muted. Yeah, it's it's good now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so just um, very quickly, um, I would like to offer the word to Ina Yoga to really um, tell us about their how they are planning to scale education. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. We're still interested in the session. 
uh, and uh, motivated to hear. I keep five minutes, I promise, uh, just to say that I really like the session, the presentation app, shown a range of different aspects of menstrual hygiene from awareness to knowledge management, coordination, to products, to infrastructure. And uh, happy to close with the key, I, I believe, which is the key aspect is education about menstruation because that can change everything. I'm presenting today about uh, Wash United's MHM Education Guide, which is an education solution for uh, girls around menstruation. When we set out in 2018 to develop uh, our new menstrual hygiene education uh, curriculum, we found that there are a good number of comprehensive tools and approaches available, which were, for example, what we saw uh, in Pakistan and in Uganda with comprehensive education. But however, they're quite costly and also complex to implement. Where we saw an opportunity was to, come, was to have a compact, easy to use and low cost solution that really everyone can use. Using a user-centered design approach, we developed the MHM Education Guide together with girls and trainers. Um, and what, is, what became clear is that we not only have to focus on education and information, but helping girls to overcome the shame and lack of knowledge through speaking with others, meaning they're engaged, and empowering them to make their own decision. The guide is now available for India in several Indian languages, in Africa, in English, French, Kiswahili, Ethiopia, and also soon in Arabic. With these features that are laid out there, it is a really an, an ideal tool to be integrated into any type of WASH, sexual reproductive health and rights program or any other educational programs. Next slide, please. Next slide. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, so far, we have reached more than 1.5 million girls with uh, the education guide. And uh, possible is this uh, because we strictly work through and with partners, such as the World Association for Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, um, ASCII in India, together with the local government there, Water Aid and Splash in um, Ethiopia, Red Cross Iraq and, and Days for Girls and, and many others uh, around there. The good news is uh, the MHM guide is available for you. Um, we make it free downloadable, downloadable on our website in quarter four. Uh, we will offer free online capacity building for trainers and program staff so you can implement it. And we also have a roster of uh, master trainers um, for you. We are aware that the COVID-19 situation might be challenging, but going online is definitely a way to go to offer this remote support. And uh, what's also quite unique is that it's possible to include your logo and of your implementing partner organization on the cover on the of the guide. So uh, without <laughs> going into much details, if you're interested to learn more, you find my contact details uh, below and happy to discuss if you're really interested to implement this very compact, low cost solution in uh, your programs. Thank you very much and thank you everyone for listening in today and today's session. All right, perfect. Thank you, Ina. And I believe that now is the right time for a big round of virtual applause to all the presenters. Um, we have seen many successful concepts and approaches being applied everywhere around the world. Um, but I think ever more important than showcasing your success stories, I think the session has kickstarted also a discussion around, um, for instance, what does the term menstruators mean? Should we use it? Yes or no? And I would encourage you to follow this discussion on the Susana Forum. I will post the link right away. And also the session organizers will be preparing a fact sheet um, about it and share the fact sheet with all of you and also on Susana later on. Um, Yes, without further ado, I think this is all from my side. Again, a big, big thank you to the event organizers for all the great technical support that they have given us. 
Um, and now I suggest in the next 10 minutes, you can join the next session coming up. Tabea, do you want to say any other famous last words? Thank you. I want to say to all the presenters, really inspiring session and uh, let's keep on the movement.